You know, last time we met was March 5th, so it's been like three months, and it's like starting to wake up from a bad dream. What's happened in three months? Um, I want to thank Debbie Buffoni. Debbie would come up my house at nine o'clock in the morning, Saturday mornings, and we'd do that that film session. And uh, she told me I. Can I still have breakfast? Yes, we would feed her, but uh, we we'd pair her with food. But uh, she, she told me I had a face made for radio. I don't know what she meant by that. <laughs> well, it's good to see everyone. You know, Dave Terry said it, the fellowship is, is what's so great about this ministry and, and the people. And we're just uh, blessed that Gary Kinder had that vision. Uh, it was his birthday on the 22nd. And so uh, I believe he turned 89. Because uh, he was born in 31, so yeah, he turned 89. Uh, we did finish Revelation after five months. Now, uh, contrary to some questions, they are all those lessons are archived uh, on YouTube. So we finished chapter 22, and then last week we did Pentecost. So all those lessons are up for your review if you like. Uh, now that we know the ending, we're going to start studying the beginning, Genesis 1-1. So I don't know what you did to keep yourselves busy during this incarceration. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there, sometimes there'd be a little tension, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I could only imagine having to stay in one room for three months. That would be hard. But, uh, so I took the time I would write the newspaper because I would watch the news, I would read the paper, and it's negative, negative, negative. It's bad, it's worse, it's horrible. What, a, what an awful country. And so, and our president, has you ever see any positive articles written about him? Um, so I wrote a positive one, and I'm amazed they published it. So I'll read it to you. And it says, Trump has been a rock in arguably the most difficult presidency since Abraham Lincoln. I am impressed with the job President Donald Trump has done. Although I don't always agree with his off-the-cuff remarks, he has been steady in his love for America from never taking a salary. You'd never hear that. He's never taken a dime for this job. To rebuffing China and Russia, through staying steady during inquisitions, pandemics, and riots in a very hostile left-leaning media, he has been a rock. I am grateful we don't have someone weak and politically correct trying to wade through those issues that are attempting to rip our country apart. And make no mistake, there are people that want to see this country ripped to shreds. I believe he genuinely has pain for what George Floyd's family has endured and deeply wants justice for his heinous death. I look for him to rebuild our economy and be reelected in November against all odds. So that was the only one in today's paper <laughs> had anything nice to say about him. So, you know, I, I have to write 10 letters before they'll run one, just, just so you know. Uh, they, they call me the quack in Plano or something. I don't know. <laughs> But you know, the events occurring in America, I just want to make some comments. I've said it on the videos a couple of times, the spirit of antichrist is loosed in America. And there's reasons for it, because we've rejected God in schools, in government, in the media, in marriage, 
in abortion. And the devil loves this anarchy. He loves division. Gary Kinder always said the devil was a divider. He loves hate, anger, murder, and lawlessness. Jesus said your father the devil was a murderer from the beginning. And so he loves what we're seeing. Now, every morning I like to listen to KRLD. I, I find they're pretty good. I like Hal J, the older guy that's been there forever. And then every day you start to telecast what chapter in Revelation are we in again? <laughs> you know, talking about the current events. And this is not the tribulation. There's going to be a great awakening one more time in America. And Vernon Lewis, General Vernon Lewis, has started an organization. Donna met with them all last week to initiate this third great awakening in the country. But these are the beginning of sorrows. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24, verses 6, 7, and 8. I'll read those to you quickly because I think it's important to uh, realize and answer people's questions. Because when they see things just dogpiling, um, you run out of sometimes answers and sometimes out of hope. But in Matthew chapter 24, the disciples want to know what's it going to be like before your second coming? What's it going to be like at the end of the church age? And he said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that you not be troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, races against races, and there shall be famines and pestilences like this COVID-19 and earthquakes in unusual places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, but there will be a great revival before the end comes. I want you to know that and hopefully you'll participate in it in ministries like Roaring Lambs and uh, singers like Tiffany we're going to have the opportunity to participate in that and give people hope because God wishes that none would perish. The thing we learned in Revelation is that God will judge evil, but he's also going to redeem his creation and he's going to redeem mankind. Now, on a lighter note, Jack Bush sent me this. I think you'll like it. And I think it's apropos for what's going on today. A while back, I read a story of a visiting pastor who attended a men's breakfast in the middle of a rural farming area of the country. The group had asked an old farmer, decked out in bib overalls, to say grace for the morning breakfast. Lord, I hate buttermilk, the farmer began. The visiting pastor opened one eye to glance at the farmer and wonder where this was going. The farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was growing concerned. Without missing a beat, the farmer continued, and Lord, you know I don't much care for raw white flour. The pastor once again opened an eye to glance around the room and saw that he wasn't the only one feeling a little uncomfortable. Then the farmer added, but Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them, I do love warm, fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us just to relax and wait till you're done mixing. It will probably even be better than biscuits. Within that prayer, there is a great wisdom for all when it comes to complicated situations like we're experiencing in the world today. Stay strong, my friends, because our Lord is mixing several things that we don't really care for, but something even better is going to come when he is done with it. So I thought that was a good story to start today's lesson. Now, if you take your outlines, uh, nice to get them in color.
And we're going to start the Old Testament, uh, primarily studying the Torah, the first five books of Moses. We finished the New Testament. This will be our fifth time through the Bible, Donna. It's hard to believe. 40 years and 23 weeks so far it took to go through four times. And the things we learned on May 31st, which was Pentecost, at the point of salvation, we received the Holy Spirit and are sealed for redemption for all eternity. You are secure in Christ because the Holy Spirit has sealed you for eternity. The evidence of salvation is expressed in bearing the nine fruits of the Spirit, which the Apostle Paul mentions in Galatians 5, 23 and 24. And those nine he mentions, the first is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, which is humility, not proud, but humility, and self-control, those nine things. And then other gifts of the Spirit include boldness and witnessing for Christ. And I think of our old friend, Smokey John Reed. Smokey John would have been a blessing for this city to have at a time like this. He did more for race relations here. His uh, restaurant became a meeting place for all colors of believers. And Smokey used to look around and say, Anton, you know, this is what heaven's going to look like. All different races. And uh, he was bold. I have a hard time going up to strangers in an airport and witnessing to them about Christ. I just, that ain't he. No. But Smokey could do it. And he could do it well. And I've seen him lead people to Christ that he had just met. He had that boldness that the apostle Peter had at Pentecost. Teaching, preaching, giving him a thank you for helping keep this ministry afloat. Administration of Christian organizations. Good works. And the last two, uh, Paul mentioned very clearly in uh, Acts chapter 14. These are not the most important gifts, but they can also be the showiest. And that is speaking in unknown languages and interpreting unknown languages, which is what happened at Pentecost. And uh, I believe in heaven, that's how we're going to be able to understand everybody with all these different dialects and languages. I think it'll be supernatural. But the most important gift is love. And that's 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2. And then praying for the nation, page two, um, we mentioned uh, <coughs> about President Trump, but the uh, state of New Mexico, how do you pronounce that name? X-O-C-H-I-T-I? Exidi? I don't know. I, but anyway, she's, she's on here. And the scripture, Romans 1.20. Yes. In that, um, New Mexico also has this to be a prayer, one of the largest abortion facilities in the nation that does abortion up until the time of birth. Oh, God. That's another reason the spirit of Antichrist is loose. But the scripture Donna picked, uh, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen so that no one is without excuse. I mean, when you just look at the creation, anybody notice the moon the last couple of nights? Just gorgeous. And so his creation speaks of his existence. And then page three, we're gonna start the Torah, uh, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, the 10 commandments were given by God at the first Pentecost, and that was on Mount Sinai, when the Jews were released from Egypt and it's about 1500 B.C. that God and Moses wrote the Ten Commandments. That's called the Baton Torah. That's the beginning of the written 
word of God. And the rest of the books Moses wrote over the 40 year period, wandering in the desert. So those 40 years were put to good use. He put all of this on, not paper, probably papyrus. And the book of beginnings, that's what Genesis stands for. And chapters one through 11 is the history of creation and mankind. And then chapters 12 to 50 is the history of the people God chose to be his own. So we'll start with Genesis 1, verse 1 through 5. Now, Donna likes the New International Version. I still use the King James. So I have her put down the New International Version because I think she thinks it's easier to understand. Uh, it's not as articulate sometimes, but it is a good version. And the first four words in the Bible, the most important four words in all the Bible is in the beginning, God. Now, a lot of people, in fact, we had a gentleman that used to come to this Bible study that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't attend when we studied the Old Testament. Uh, he didn't believe it. And as much as I could talk to him and Gary could talk to him, he still didn't believe it. Well, Jesus believed it. And I think if uh, all of the Old Testament prophets believed it, all of the key people, the disciples believed it, I think it's important we do our best to understand it. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and empty darkness over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. Now, in science today, they say the universe started what was called what? The Big Bang Theory. That there was this tremendous explosion of energy. Well, where did that come from? I believe that is just another description of this verse. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from darkness and called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, and that was the first day. God created the heavens and the earth. And then Genesis 1, 9, and 10. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so, and God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Now, some people try to put creation in a box that it happened over a certain time period. Gary always taught, and I firmly believe too, that there's what's called a gap theory. It could be millions of years that this creation took place. Um, the Bible says that one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years says one day. Uh, there's theories that it took six days to create the earth, 6,000 years. Uh, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. What matters is that I know God created it and said it was good. And then Genesis 1, 16 to 18. And God made two great lights, the great light to cover the day and the lesser light to cover the night, like that beautiful moon that we've seen. He also made the stars, and God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. You know, a lot of people say evolution is how this happened. And I don't believe in macro evolution, which means one species can become another. Or as Zig Ziglar used to say, out of the goo 
and into the zoo, and then it became you. <laughs> uh, I don't buy that. Now, species can adapt. They can adapt to climates and things like that, but I don't believe that they go from one species to another. And then Genesis 1, 26 to 28, God creates man. And this is, uh, this is so key because it's the, also the first mention of the Trinity in Scripture. And God said, let us, the plural, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all wild animals, and over all the creatures that move on the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Two genders, that's it. Male and female. And Tom? Yes. Yeah. There was a learned professor there, and he said that in the universities, they teach that there are 1,031 different genders. 1,031 different genders. Huh? I can't even understand what that means. Yeah, tell me the third one out of 1,000. <laughs> but it's, it's plural now. Randy Worsham and I were talking about the other day, actually Randy was several months ago, that what does it mean to be created in God's image? Well, God was a creator. Mankind can create things. They have that ability to create. Also, mankind, not saying that we're going to look exactly like God. I don't think that's what he's talking about. But I think what he's talking about, the attributes of God are in us. The ability to love. The ability to have free will, which we all do. Uh, I think that's what he's talking about. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then Genesis 2, 3, then God blessed the seventh day, the Sabbath, and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, I don't think it was because God was tired. I think he wanted to absorb what he had done, what he had accomplished. He wanted to appreciate the beauty and kind of soak it in. Um, my wife spent all day yesterday in the kitchen changing out all the hardware on all the cabinets because they were 34 years old. They you know, kind of looked that old. So she changed all these out herself. And so, uh, yeah, I was, you know, preparing my study. <laughs> but she, she spent all day doing that. And then I'd catch her, she'd go back in just admiring it, you know, just appreciating what she had done and accomplished, and, and, and rightfully so. It was very well done. And so I think that's what God did on the seventh day. He kind of soaked it all in. And then Genesis 2, 7, 8, and 9. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden where he put the man that he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, he 
commanded Adam not to eat from that tree. And the reason he commanded him not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that man would do what was right in his own eyes. He wouldn't do what God says is right and wrong. But he gave him free will. And we kind of know how that story goes when Jehovah cautions man and creates the woman. And that's Genesis 2, 16 to 18. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. The Lord God said it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so Eve is going to be created, but God didn't warn Eve. He warned Adam. Adam made the sin, and Eve ate this, the same sin, but it was Adam who was commanded not to do it. So then Genesis 2, 21 to 25. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, now this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And that's where I always insert the joke, and that's a lot of flesh in our case. <laughs> and then Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. And you know why? They didn't have mirrors back then. <laughs> so God has created the man and the woman. And we're going to study all of Genesis and how this got started and how we studied already, how it finished. But let's open it up for any questions or comments. It's... Um, it's God's masterpiece, this earth. And I believe he created it specifically for mankind, for fellowship with their God, ultimately, when he creates the new heaven and the new earth here, refreshes it and uh, makes it perfect again. So I think... Um, and, and I'd like to make a point relative to what's going on with these demonstrations and sure. these riots. The, the truth is, there is only one race of human beings on this planet. It's the human race. That is, that is genetically, biologically true. Everything else is an expression of the phenotype of our genes. But we are all so closely related genetically that you cannot distinguish between one man and another, one woman and another, in terms of race. There's only one race. Smokey John used to say that, Jim. You know, we all bleed red. You know, when we were on our honeymoon, Don and I, in 1979, we went to San Diego, and that's right, we stayed in Encinitas, which is the flower capital of the world. And you drive by and there's these beautiful, beautiful fields, all different color flowers just growing together and they're just gorgeous. And it made me think about what you just said, you know, people are, are people. Um, I think the things that helped me, because I lived through the riots in New Jersey in 1967, took a, almost a fatal beating during those riots. Uh, 
but a wonderful black woman saved my life. And uh, then the teammates in football, I mean, you become very, very close. And then being partners with Smokey was the coup de grace. Uh, that, uh, yeah. that really helped me understand the golden rule. Any other questions? Tiffany? Just a comment. So maybe also that as far as uh, just the wonder and the grandeur of God's creation, some of you may have heard, um, I don't know how many years ago, the study came out that scientists have determined that the planets are really staying together as they are through sound waves. And so to think that the Lord spoke it, spoke it. and it's continuing. And also on the heels of what Jim just said, um, the power of God's words and the power of our words, God through us, right? And what we can do to not, and I've even been encouraged to just read the Bible aloud when I'm in my home to let that atmosphere change, you know, let the demons be alerted, but um, just the power of our spoken word and, and God's. It's true. It's true. Well, here's what I put down, what we learned. It'll be on your lesson for next week. God created mankind in his image with the ability to create, to love, and to have free will. Man was made to follow the Lord and live forever. That's why we were created. And then number two, because Adam and Eve succumbed to the devil's temptation to disobey God and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin and the curse of death entered the world. And then three, their eating from the forbidden tree meant that they would do what was right in their own eyes instead of what God says is good and what is evil. This is evident in our society today. People do what's right in their own eyes for the most part. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day. And Lord, I'm especially grateful to see my friends of this family of believers called Roaring Lambs. And God, I thank you for each person here today. I pray that you would bless them, that you would supernaturally protect them, guard their health, their family's health, their businesses, and I just pray that uh, we'll be able to freely study your word here each week. And that will give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. We'll see you next week unless we get raptured. Yay.